So, uh, uh, I think I'll start the meeting formally again. Welcome to the March Zoom meeting of the Clyde River Sleeper Club. Uh, this is the third presentation we have done uh, via Zoom. We had uh, a uh, AGM uh, back in October or November, which we uh, we did on Zoom as well. So, um, any suspicion that we're going to get good at this, um, I'll leave it to yourselves to decide. Um, everyone is now muted, uh, apart from myself, and uh, if I can remind uh, him if, if he hasn't already done so, uh, I would ask John McNulty to unmute himself. Yep, done. Good. John is our uh, guest speaker this evening. Uh, by way of introduction, I, let me uh, just say that uh, John is uh, the, the maker of wonderful uh, model steamers. Uh, and uh, I've seen a little bit of what he's going to talk about. And I'm enthralled. I, it's going to be uh, really wonderful to, to hear from John. He tells me that uh, his interest in model making uh, of steamers uh, first arose when he was about 10 years of age, which is uh, some time ago. I won't say how, how many years ago, John, but uh, it was something that uh, his, his father had a great interest in and indeed uh, had made a model of, uh, I think, the Maid of Ashton when John was about 10. And uh, he, you caught the bug, John. I think that's what we should say. It has become, uh, over the, the years, uh, and indeed uh, the model steamer club, which uh, uh, John's father was a stalwart of, uh, was formed in 1969-70. Uh, and John has been, uh, has that interest, uh, hobby, hobby, call it hobby, call it obsession, uh, all of his life. Uh, he tells me that he has now, and we may see his part of uh, this uh, in his presentation, uh, uh, a workshop uh, purpose built for the, the purposes of uh, his model making activities. And uh, uh, I, I don't think there's much more by way of introduction to say. Uh, John, some of you may have seen his models. Uh, some of you may not uh, have any notion of of how superb these uh, these models are. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to our guest speaker tonight. Uh, he, I think, describes himself uh, as a model shipwright. Uh, and I think you'll discover when John delivers his uh, presentation tonight, you'll discover model shipwright is a very, very appropriate description. So, John, you're unmuted, my friend. The audience is yours. You can share screen and off you jolly well go. Okay. So, good evening. And thank you, Andy, for inviting me to give this presentation about my lifelong hobby of building model ships and steamers in particular. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this Zoom meeting. Hopefully my broadband will be up to the job. I'm speaking to you from a Highland Glen, just north of Inverary, in Glen Era, on the side of a mountain, with views, if it were daylight, to Ben Cruach into the north. And I'm surrounded by Gaelic named hills, can't pronounce, which used to be populated by many, but are now just a handful of properties. I'm in my model steamer room, and behind me, Jeannie Deans, and this side, two turbines, KG5 and Duchess of Hamilton. My story is intertwined with the history of the Model Steamer Club, which remains active to this day in cataloguing and 
prolonging in 3D the excursion steamers of the River Clyde. You can meet up with these guys at Rook and Glen Loch on Saturdays from about 2 p.m. during the summer months and see what they're up to. In Middergale, we have a new group called Mars, the Middergale Radio Sailing, <laughs> which is associated with the Model Yachting Association of the UK. It's principally set up for racing standard yachts. Um, but they found out about me and invited me along. So we get quite a mixture now. I think we've got about 20 members. And uh, most Saturdays, if the weather's good, we're there at Loch Avarin, which is part of the Crinan Canal. It's the top stretch of the Crinan Canal at Cairnban. So I've entitled tonight's presentation, John McNulty Model Shipwright. I prefer the term model shipwright to model boat builder in the same way you would think about the King George V as a ship or a steamer and not a boat. The KG5 carry four boats and sometimes six. I began model, building model ships when I was 10 years old, 60 years ago. Much of the inspiration to build model ships was from the Glasgow Model Ship Collection, housed then in Kelvin Grove. I used to be taken there to view that marvellous collection of steamers, liners, warships, and I used to imagine them afloat. Indeed, wondered if they would float. Just imagine if they could be launched and they would actually work. I commend to you the recent publication, Glasgow Museums, The Ship Models, which catalogues the 676 models in the collection. If anyone needs inspiration for this hobby, get this book. It describes the profession in detail and divides it into the various categories from professional, commercial and amateur into mm. which category I fall, static and working. Models of ships and boats go back thousands of years and have been found in Egyptian tombs, Roman relics and Viking burials. What does a model shipwright do? The easiest way to describe it is to create a 3D image of a complex shaped object, which is designed to travel through water efficiently and safely. And this applies as much today if you're hoping to sell something to a commercial company and you want to impress them with your design. Models were made to test and refine design and have been an integral part of shipbuilding. A fine display model could be used to display to audiences around the world with the older versions being used to archive design concepts. With design, comes the concept of fairness. Fairness is the harmonious flow of a hull from bow to stern. But it also suggests the suitability of that hull form for the business of that ship, whether that is to transport goods around the world, across oceans, or passengers around the Firth of Clyde on a summer's day. If you have joined the Clyde River Steamer Club, you have already been smitten by the concept of fairness and beauty of form of Clyde steamers. 
This is even expressed for the current fleet of ferries, where functionality has taken over from attractiveness. But we still have our favourites. Period of interest for me has to be the 19th and 20th century and the Clyde excursion steamers built to impress and intrigue with their fairness and beauty of form, their attractive colour schemes and speed. The capital steamers have received most attention from me. Duchess of Hamilton, Jeannie Deans and King George V. This has to be the biggest model ship I can find. It's a model of the battleship Yamato. It's at Kure, Kure near Hiroshima. It's to a scale of one in ten. I was apprenticed to my father. He had a career in heavy engineering at Harvey Machine Tools, Govan. This is a press he's building here. He set about to build our first model, the Maid of Ashton, about 1961. I don't remember where he got the drawings, but it was constructed in the bread and butter method, with layers of pine cut and glued together to form the hull, which was then feared and smoothed. This is the method of construction employed in the majority of the Glasgow collection models. Indeed, many of them having a thin veneer of mahogany placed between the pine to produce a line in the feared hull to define the distance from the keel and allow for future measurements to be taken off the model. Some of the half models were used in the shipyards as plating models, where every plate was drawn on the hull and numbered for use in taking off the shape of each plate, particularly at complex areas such as the turn of the bilge, where it would be impossible to predict on a two-dimensional drawing. Indeed, these models were stored on the roof beams of the shop after the ship was complete and kept in case of future alterations or repairs, when the model could be taken down and plates prepared in advance. I still have the made of Ashton and here it is. It was built in one eighth of an inch to the foot and is very small. So small, in fact, that in order to make it operational, it had an extra plank of half inch added to the hull to provide buoyancy. And it also had a steel keel, which was detachable to keep it upright. It had two miniature electric motors which drove two shafts with elastic bands. You can see the, the, the wheels on the shafts there. You simply took it to the park, which is usually for us Maxwell Park, put the small electric accumulator battery inside and switched on the motors from a deck switch. You set the rudders and you let it go. We had a cane each to try to set some sort of course across and around the pond. But it was basically a matter of hoping it would come back to shore at some point in the day and be caught. The worst case scenario was a circular course around the middle of the pond and out of reach from the bank. Or it would simply run out of power and drift to shore. We kept a small lead weight attached to fishing line in our pocket for the ultimate retrieval if required, throwing the weight between the masts and hauling the model in. Here's my father with the cane. A few onlookers. 
this was a situation for a long time and a series of models were constructed where we honed our skills with the Stanley knife and sandpaper and a, a wonderful creativity and use of anything lying around. Like elastoplast tins, bean cans, balsa wood and glue from the hub shop in Shollins, it's also a bicycle shop, or the Clyde model dockyard in a guy arcade, or Glassworth's model shop in Cambridge Street. And there was an army surplus shop in Glassford Street under the bridge where you could buy a World War II bomb site from a Lancaster bomber. This contained a load of motors, relays, gears, and lots of other goodies. I learned how to cut without losing the ends of my fingers, to solder without getting burned, and to paint without getting the carpet. The workshop was a folding card table in the sitting room and it all had to be put away each night. Subjects completed included two Duchesses, Jeannie Deans, Waverley, KG5, St Columba, and that's what's left of them. Quarter inch to the foot, Waverley. Duchess of Montrose. Jeannie Deans. Collision course. Queen Mary. St. Columba. Duchess of Hamilton. Columba. These are old photographs. Caledonia, Blue Caledonia, St. Columba, Queen Mary. I don't know why we took so many. We always had an onlooker. Complete with fag and mouth. KG5 and Duchess of Montrose. Montrose again. A Duchess of Argyle, Maxwell Park. St. Columba. Queen Mary. Argyle again. Here's the fleet. Is it a collision course? Fleet again. Photographs are old. Now, you're supposed to be looking at the model ships, but remember, I can see your wallpaper. A Glen Sanox. Slightly better photograph. A Montrose. A tugboat. Now this is at Maxwell Park. And I think it must have been a advertised show. There's a one gentleman with a hat towards the right hand side of the photo at the back. And I think that's David Morton. I don't Great. know. If Oh, Remember David Morton? I don't know if you recognise anyone else there, or if you did if you're there yourself. Maxwell Park again. This is Queen's Park. 
And we, we seem to have got the fire brigade involved. A wee crowd there to watch. This is a Columba, not very good photo, I'm afraid. We had occasional trips to Greenock to check the hibernating steamers in the Albert Harbour and confirm details. So there's a big and a wee Montrose in the stern of the Junie Danes. 64. Or sometimes we actually went on a cruise. I particularly remember a trip to Craig and Dorn as I really wanted to sail on the nearly new Waverley. I think it was 61. We lived in Thornley Bank and the journey by car, Vauxhall Velux, was via the fairly tortuous road to Paisley and Renfrew for the ferry, then down by the whiskey warehouses at Dumbarton with the guard geese, past Denny's, to the pier and railhead at Craig and Dorn, where, to my horror, was birthed the Jeannie Deans and not the Waverley. Well, this was a disappointment which is to turn into something else. I had a cruise round Butte on the Jeannie Deans and I was converted. Who wouldn't be? These are my box brownie photos. from 60 years ago. Still remember the thrill of that steamer. What character she and her crew had and fast to boot. I have a vivid recollection of the final leg from Guruk to Craig and Dorn with the sun setting over Guruk and the wake over the broad stern of Jeannie. But the Waverley reminds me of her and every sail nowadays takes me back to that day. I think that might be Joe McKendrick and his father sitting there on the aft deck, if anyone can remember. Back at Craig and Dorn. We attracted some attention at Maxwell Park Pond and inevitably others started doing the same thing and turning up with various models from tugboats and warships to yachts and steamers. George Sutherland was a game changer when he appeared with the very first radio control. George was an electrician who graduated through night classes to working on guidance systems at Baron Stroud, I think for the Centurion tank. He had a Dutch S of Fife, this one, and a large trawler. And they had a telephone exchange counter inside the, the vessel and a transmitter in a big wooden box ashore powered by a car battery and it had the phone dial. The area was at least six feet tall. Number one, click the counter by one, and this tripped a switch which gave port rudder. The counter then returned to neutral. Dialing two gave a midships rudder, and three gave starboard. Four was slow ahead, and so on, up to nine. It all worked. But as you can imagine, there was considerable time delay between each command, and it was a challenge to operate. Number nine took the longest, and I think that was full astern. The model had quite a few chips in the bow. Nevertheless, we now had radio control. Busy day at Craig and Dorn. Do you know KG5, Duchess of Fife, and the Jeannie Dean swinging into 
Bessie, Bessie, can't remember. Commercial radio followed with various systems, mostly powered by crystals of which there were about 10 put into colors to represent the different frequencies. Two models could not have the same frequency or they would interfere. In addition, we seemed to be close to the police frequencies as we could play a tune on their car radio. Every skipper had to obtain and display a colour ribbon on their aerial to inform the others for what frequency they were using and either switch to a different set or politely ask to take over a colour someone else was using. By winter 69-70, we had formed the Model Steamer Club and had regular meetings at the pond and gave exhibitions and displays. One of our regular displays was De Noon at the West Bay Lido. And this is my father with his King George V coming into De Noon Pier in De Noon. We built a box trailer and someone fitted a tow bar to the car to transport the models by ferry. I've also found some old film of a swimming bath, I think Coat Bridge or Airdrie, where we were able to get underwater shots of the models. We were commissioned by a film director for a movie which he was making, which required a paddle steamer appearing out of the mist. He took us to a house in Kilmacomb with a pond in the garden and used dry ice for the effect. I believe the film's called Clyde Scope and it starred Billy Connolly before he was famous. There's a clip on YouTube of Billy playing his banjo on the starboard paddlebox of Waverley, sailing down the Kyles of Butte. So here we've got Jeannie Deans, St. Columba, Juno, Duchess of Fife, KG5, and the Montrose, I think, in this chap's garden. The pond apparently was laid out to mimic the Kyles of Butte. Here's another view. The shed on the top right-hand corner of the photograph apparently is the wheelhouse of the Duchess of Fife. And here you have the skippers on the bridge, George Sutherland on the left, Liam McLean in the middle, and Robin Hurst on the right-hand side, with St. Columba underneath. Around this time, I produced several waterline models for sale to subsidise my student grant. Douglas has got one. We used to create smoke. This is not a particularly good photograph, but I'd see all of them. Um, we used to create smoke uh, by burning rolled up newspaper and oily rags soaked with saltpetre, potassium nitrate, one of the ingredients of gunpowder. It was a little bit hit and miss. So it depended how much air was being fed in and how much saltpetre had been soaked in the paper. So a little bit risky. The Jupiter. I'd been getting a bit frustrated with the performance of these wee models, particularly with surface tension effects, which would grab a paddle sponson and hold it down in the surface, giving the model a list. The answer I came up with was to increase the size of the model.
This is um, Colin Galleries, I think. Collection of models. And here we have the hostess with the mostest. Caledonian Steam Packet Company had a couple of hostesses. I can't remember what year. And this is on PS Caledonia. Larks Pier with the Duchess. Box trailer being constructed. This is George Sutherland. Ken Anderson. Tom Duthie. And here's the bigger model, Queen Mary. This is three sixteenths of an inch to the foot. It was an improvement, although it was built with twin screws rather than triple, simply because it wasn't big enough. I still got it, it's been renovated recently. One of the benefits of having a lockdown. Most of us now switch to quarter of an inch to the foot models, which are five or six feet long and could be transported in a family car. So along came another watershed, still quarter of an inch to the foot, but a bigger ship, the Lady of Man. This clocked in at three inches short of nine feet. What a difference in performance. And it's still fitted in my minivan with the front seat out and the back door open. At last, a hull with plenty of room for all the equipment you might want, but so much improved and a realistic performance and capability. And also a much larger profile and more more impressive in the water. All models shrink once you launch them, stand back. But the bigger the model, the more impressive it is. If I ask an onlooker at the Loch Tide what size he thinks the large models are, they will, without exception, say six feet. But then they've already asked if it's the Titanic or the Waverley. I think that these photos of Lady Man are in Queen's Park from the 70s. Twenty twenty, Loch Avarine at Cairnban. She sails again. Here she is in Laments. Surprisingly tidy workshop. This is actually tidy. Test tank in the garden. And let's see how we get on with one of my sugarly videos. Lock of Varain, again, Cairnban, August 2020, during lockdown. The Mars group was considered a sport, and we were allowed 12 people at a time at the log side. There's no sound here because whenever you take out a camera, someone sidles up beside you and talks all the way through the clip. <laughs> so I've taken it out of this clip. By this time I had left school and was studying at Strathclyde Uni doing pharmacy. I obtained my degree in 1973 and started my post-degree training in Paisley with the Parkinson Group at Moss Street. I moved to a flat in Barhead, which had a garage, which never had a car in it. 
a workshop at last. No need to tidy up after each session. Just shut the door, come back to the same task the next day. This is when I hatched the plan for a proper large scale model. I had a complete set of drawings from Harlan and Wolf for the Duchess of Hamilton, as well as at least two existing models in different scales. She was languishing in the East India Harbour awaiting her fate. But how to manage it? Half inch to the foot, this is going to be 11.33 feet long and very heavy. Here she is in Loch Awe at a place called Drishig. And the water in the distance is actually um, the river Orkey, where it enters Loch Awe. But now most of us have become experts in the technology of glass reinforced plastic. And I was now earning and had some disposable income. So along to the local builder's merchant for expanded polystyrene foam sheets, the kind which had cardboard surfaces. And I cut planks of foam in the old bread and butter manner, which I then glued and fared with coarse sandpaper. I built to main deck level and had to form the mould to slightly smaller than scale in order to skim the surface with plaster of Paris to prevent the resin coming in contact with the foam as they would react. I then cast a fiberglass hull on the mould, giving me a smooth interior and a rough exterior, which then required a lot of sanding and filling. But I had a hull, and once reinforced with plywood bulkheads, it was rigid and strong enough not to bend, thus providing a solid basis for completion. When handling the large scale models, I always lift the stern to protect the rudder and screws. So all the weight rests on the bow. This makes it impossible to include bow rudders as the bow would collapse. So I draw them on. Main deck to promenade deck for the Duchess was built with two mil ply and four millimetre plywood decks lined with a ballpoint pen to represent planking. I placed two parallel bulkheads from keel to promenade deck just ahead of the distinctive four windows forward of the engine room grating and drilled holes above the water line through prior to cutting the hull into two sections, one of about eight feet and the bow of about three feet with the holes aligned so that the two sections could be bolted together, each one having its own buoyancy. Problem solved. It would fit into the minivan if I had removed the passenger seat and I could just lift the big section with, without the batteries in it. So I had a large hull, a bow piece, and a promenade shade deck, deck section fitted on top. The two masts were rigged in each section and all the electrics and mechanics were in the big piece. She weighed in at about 80 kilogram with the batteries. I think it was 1974 she was ready to launch. She had three windscreen wiper motors out of scrap cars and two car batteries for power and ballast. Radio control was still using rear stats for speed control. This was done by using a servo to turn a lever, which made contact with a series of brass plates and each one was connected to a different voltage to the motor. And also you could reverse the polarity for a stern. This is how you did it. And I remember the circuitry well, as the motors were field wound, that is, the rotor was wound, but the field was also round, wound. So you had to reverse polarity on either rotor or field, but not both. There were lots of relays involved. 
I sneaked off to Rook and Glen Pond early one Sunday morning before the rowing boats were hired out at 1pm and the hostile parkie was hiding somewhere and got her launched and trimmed and set her off in trials. The Glen had a ramp for recovering the rowing boats and actually had two rails into the water. I placed the stern on a two-wheel trolley, the bow like a wheelbarrow, and simply rolled it into the water. Here she is alongside with the wee Loch Nevis, which belonged to Philip McCarra. I didn't film or photograph that launch day. I was too busy, but she went. And I was fair impressed, not to say chuffed. This was definitely the way to go. We had a wash and a wake, some realistic heavy appearance, particularly when trying to stop, nothing sticking to the surface and sufficiently seaworthy to handle any weather. Took a long time to finish the fittings in detail on the Duchess, as you, you have to provide so much more detail on the larger scale, including a dining room, tables and chairs, the promenade deck with basket chairs and everything illuminated. It's quite a challenge to work out access, especially after I permanently joined the hull back together, having bought a bigger car and built a trailer. The Duchess has a removable aft deck and a hatch to lower deck to get to the dining room and prop shafts, which are over four feet long and have three internal bearings, which have to be lubricated. The engine and boiler room are accessed by removing the funnels, then the promenade deck. The fore deck is fixed. So I haven't been in there for 48 years. Should have left a message in there for someone. Although all my models are now carrying memory sticks on the bridge with an electronic history and photographs in the style of a dog chip. The Duchess has had a varied sailing career and several upgrades and services. But I think the venues might be of interest. She sailed the Rook and Glen Pond, Queen's Park, Dunstaffnage Bay, which is this photograph, the Dewloch, Loch Nell, Aubrey Pond Largs, Loch Sween, Crinning Canal, Loch Fine, and recently Loch of Varane. Here she is Loch Fine at the village of Minard. Again, Minard alongside the pier. Minard Pier. On her way to Campbelltown. This is my son. Just to give you an idea of the scale. She's probably the best of my three large models to sail as she has a central screw, which is immediately in front of the rudder. And this gives much better steerage. I remember watching in the engine room hatch on the real thing coming into the Rossi, that the center screw was left turning slowly ahead, even when the wing screws were running astern. This obviously gave greater turning power on the rudder, even though it was taking longer to stop. This is Aubrey Pond in uh, Largs. As a fundraiser, I was persuaded to offer a quiz for round table funds in Middergau. We displayed it in a shop window in Loch Gilphead with our batteries. And the question was, how far will she go on one charge? We got a lot of answers, but then had to meet the challenge. So she was launched on the canal at Loch 4 in Ardrishig 
and we followed her in a dinghy without board towards Cairnban, with a man ashore pushing a wheelie measuring machine along the towpath. She went to Cairnban, four or five knots, Julie arrived. So we turned and went back to Adrishig with all the lights on, blowing the horn, anything to drain the batteries. At which point I inquired if there were any answers in the region of eight miles, to which the reply was no. <laughs> so we ended it there, and to this day, I don't know the answer. We raised over £500. Clinton Canal at Dunardry. Some better light in that photo. This is Drishig Loch Awe, alongside Vital Spark. T Valak Bay, um, part of Loch Sween. Back to Dunstaffnage. Preparing to launch. And Staffnage again. Connell Bridge, the background. It was a wee bit choppy that day. Castle in the background. Back to Rook and Glen early on a Sunday morning. A wash in a week. Back on the Crinan Canal. The only day I've had two of the large models sale. Loch Fine. There's the Largs. Loch Fine. At uh, Minard. In the distance is Inver Cottage Restaurant in Castle Lachlan. Looking back at the village. On our way to Inverary. That's Furnace Quarry in the background. And here she is, Loch of Arain. September 20. There's no sound here, so someone must have talked all the way through it. This is in Loch Sween, Te Valach. I think my son was on the helm here. Foot to the floor.
again, sun driving. Thought I might take you a wee sail on the Duchess tonight. This is outside the house. Now this is something you never saw when you were buying your postcards at Campbelltown. What the crew had to do while you were on your hour ashore clear the, the weed off the propellers. It's a busy place, Steve Alec Bay. Plenty of obstacles. I've got a couple of videos I've taken on board where on occasions like this with high water, where the mullet used to come right into the loch close to shore and they would appear on the video like basking sharks. They're not in this one. Picking up a bit of speed now. This is what you do in lockdown. You get an angle grinder and you attack your model ship. Old and new. The right hand side are the original shafts and tubes, which were mild steel. It's what I could afford at the time. And the left hand side are new brass three quarter inch tubes, phosphor bronze, bearings, and eight mil stainless steel shafts. A new ball racing score inside. So here they are going back on. Angle grinder on the floor. You'll notice the Waverley's been Saved by this time. It's now sail the Waverley. I moved to Auburn in 1975, just missing the KG5, and practiced in a new pharmacy on the Esplanade next to the gem box and the local surgery. We built a new house at Kilmore and it had a cellar incorporated 
to house the Duchess. We'd rented a flat at Dunstaffnage while the build was going on, and that's when she sailed in the bay, where the marina is now. By this time, I was losing contact with the guys at the Model Steamer Club, and they moved their operation to Rook and Glen in 72, I think, to escape the weed problem at Maxwell Park. Ironically, that's now a big problem at the Glen. In the winter 76, 77, I was approached to purchase the pharmacy news agent tobacconist at Inverary. And to my surprise, my parents were very keen. My father was being squeezed out of engineering by the dreaded computer, and apparently had always wanted to run a shop. His father had been a publican at Tradeston, the Glenleven Bar, and at Finiston Street, a bar called Dirty Dicks next to the Queen's Dock. But Father had steadfastly refused to take them on. We duly moved to Inverary in the spring of 77. The property was large enough to split and share with a rear store and a large garage for the model ships. I got permission from the Duke to use the Dewlock and Glen Shearer for sailing and it was only a short drive from the town. I used to come and watch. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be a long semi-retirement for my father, as he died of a heart attack while on holiday in Rome in September 78, at age 57. In Inverary, I now had more space and a workshop, even though it doubled as a storeroom for cigarettes and fancy goods. So out came the drawings for the genie games, and a set to a new build, again, half inch to the foot. This time I chose to build a wooden frame and plank with four mil ply, sealing the hull with glass reinforced plastic on the inside. The wheels were made of aluminium with mild steel boss and half inch shaft and wooden floats which were made from a broken piece of Waverley's paddle uh, in Iroko. I remember it taking a surprisingly few months to get it afloat and working, but then a year or so to finish. She was launched in the Dulock in 79, unfinished, and in CSP colours, until I changed my mind and finished her in LNER 46, 47 colours, in which condition she has remained, although I do have a set of buff funnels for her. At this point, it might be worth mentioning the next Clyde River Steamer Club meeting, which is the AGM, Wednesday 21st of April, Zoom meeting, when Ian Quinn will be discussing Jeannie Dean's LNER. So that's one for your diary. The original power was provided from a windscreen motor from Semple's garage and a belt drive out of a lawnmower. This was later upgraded with a Sinclair C5 electric motor, which is still in there. This is the Duloch. I don't know which one of us is wearing best. You'll notice the transmitter's got a brown ribbon on it. So it's a brown crystal and brass telegraphs, which made it very hairy. Here she is, Minard Pier, Loch Fine. Minard Pier with the tide coming in. Tay Valak Bay. 
And she's had a trip on the Waverley. Although I got a fair bit of ribbon for the green anti violin. It's Craig and Dawn in the background. No. Does anyone recognize that place? Tinnebuch, Kyle's a beaut. And the reason we're there is to meet Waverley. Two paddlers at Tinnebuch. Can't remember the date. Ian Quinn will know. She makes quite a noise in the water, as you might expect, and handles just like the real thing, which is somewhat unpredictable, particularly in a wind. Which leads me to an interesting question I would like to ask you. The model is one in 24. So she's sailing far too fast for scale. The wheel's doing over 200 revs. But does that mean that a five miles per hour wind is 120 miles an hour to scale? Five times 24. And that the effect is extreme. Does the model become unstable and inoperable in a 10 miles an hour wind, which is 240 miles an hour. And coming to that, you're placing the model ship in the same fluid as the real ship. You haven't scaled the water. So what happens with wave effect and buoyancy? And should the water and air be made 24 times more dense to be scaled to the model? Tomato soup or minestrone? It would certainly need more ballast. I have often wondered about the Denny test tank in Dumbarton. The model hulls are built to scale, mostly one in 48, but the water in the tank is ordinary water. So is the wave pattern going to mimic the real ship when it's built? Apparently it did, because the tank continued in use and was a success. Something to discuss in the pub over a pint, I think, without coming to blows. These are the curved floats I put on during lockdown. New deck. In time, the ballpoint pen on the plywood disappears. The effects of daylight. So it's all been replaced with teak. This, this wee video clip has got sound, but it's in slow motion, so you can't hear what they're saying. But I've left the sound on this one. You've heard of taking the dog for a walk. 
take Jeannie Deans for a walk. These are Mick Wober's photographs at Rook and Glen. Alongside the pier with Lord of the Isles number one. Now this is the forward lounge on the main deck, which I have been unable to find a photograph of. So there's some doll's house furniture in there, but if anyone's got a photograph or a good memory, this is back to Loch Awe. Dining room. Another on board. Rook and Glen. Now, you might wonder what that is. It's a 30 foot model of HMS Invincible. And the reason it's there is because Duncan, who was then the owner, phoned me up to arrange a meeting. He was doing displays at the Yacht Races Festival, East Loch Harbour. They're actually in the same scale. So I joined him in East Loch Tarbert, and this is the view from Invincible. Here's some repairs and alterations, new decks. The view inside the forward saloon. The doors in the forward saloon. Fittings. She's getting a new set of funnels and vents here. Now, this is Strone School. I put myself down with the education department in Island Butte to go around the schools and um, tell the story of the Clyde Steamers um, to the next generation. And uh, I've only had one shout so far, and it was to Strone. Uh, and despite being assured they had a big hall, when I got there, I couldn't get her in the hall. So we were outside in the playground. And uh, the children all came out with midgey nets over their head. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't have one. 
<laughs> due course, the midges came down. And uh, the kids had a great afternoon. They all had to build a model ship. And uh, one of them told me his, his dad was going to make him two when he went home. So they had a great time. What was interesting was in the staff room after um, the kids had gone home, the headmistress and the teaching assistant and the janitor were amazed. They had they knew nothing about Clyde Steamers. They knew nothing about the three loss uh, cruises and the ships that used to ply um, past their front door. After Jane Dean's, my modelling went into a kind of hibernation due to work and family commitments. Uh, I purchased a yacht hull and had it craned into my backyard in Inverary, fitted it out prior to launch at the pier. There followed a period of cruising on the Clyde and Western Isles, and I obtained my RYA Coastal Skippers ticket. I still have a 1904 48-foot wooden schooner, which keeps me occupied. This is craning it out. We moved to T. Valak in 20, uh, 2007, built a concrete garage and workshop with wood stove. It wasn't until I managed to dispose of the businesses in Inverary and Loch Gilphead that I considered building anything else. But I'd always tried to keep my fleet in order, although some of the original smaller scale models had been stored in various locations and fell victim to mice. On retirement, I set to tidying up the Duchess and Jeannie. By now, the electronics had moved on. A new frequency range had been allocated to model makers, mainly for aircraft and for drones. It used to be compulsory to buy a radio license before transmitting, but not anymore. You don't need a license to use radio control to bomb somebody in Baghdad. Two gigahertz radio sets were now affordably available and they allow up to 50 users to operate in the same location. Importantly, the transmitter and receiver communicate with one another in the same manner as your car key does with your car. And the radio sets do channel hopping, depending on what they monitor in the vicinity. Transmitter sends a signal code and receives a reply code on the frequency locking the two together, thus eliminating the chance of interference. You can even see the battery voltage aboard the model displayed on the transmitter screen. So no more coloured flags from the aerial, and the whole club can simply come along to the pond and switch on without worrying about a clash. In addition, the stated range is 4,000 metres, yeah, four kilometres. Although untried, as I don't think you'd see where you were going, especially true when your model's sailing across your field of vision. I think the next trick is to have a camera on the bridge and view your signal on your mobile phone where you could record just like a drone. I got back in touch with the guys of the steamer club through Ship Ahoy. I took Jeannie down to Gifnet in my long wheelbase master van left over from the businesses. I can actually get three large scale models in the van, two in the floor and one on a mezzanine shelf. I install when required. It was the model steamer club members who reminded me that I had built nothing for a long time. And the gauntlet was on the floor. Ian McGee asked me what I might build. And I replied the KG5, of course, with a large collection of photographs of her, mostly in winter hibernation in Greenock, but taken with a view to the small details of her fittings. Although the drawings I had were incomplete. Within a month, Ian had located a set of Denny drawings, collected them from Straven, had them copied in Glasgow, and then delivered them to Tevala. They were stamped Denny's 1952, and I assume she had some repairs or alterations then. What choice did I have? So how do you build a working model ship? 
or more especially, how did I build the one in 24 scale King George V? Because this is not normal. It took the month of August 2017 to plan the project and check the drawings. The length of the drawings was 1% out on the small side, the ship being 270 foot 6 inches. The model would be 11.27 feet by 1.33 feet beam. So that 1% is always to be taken into account. As I've described, the two large-scale models were mostly built of plywood GRP, and the real steamers were steel. I always felt that the small details, did the whole effect should be metallic to get that realistic effect. I remember seeing a model of Waverley, which had been constructed of steel, and it just looked metallic because it was. I had used aluminium sheet to make some repairs on the Duchess hull where there had been some distortion. I was impressed by the effect, especially when I'd drilled holes and placed some pinheads to represent rivets. Could I get a fair and pleasing hull in metal? I googled aluminium and epoxy and also looked into welding. Aluminium can be glued with epoxy resin if you first clean off the invisible oxide which forms on the surface. I tried welding, but the low melting point meant it simply melted rather than joined. A lot of planning was applied to the access issues, no matter how much you try, there have to be areas which you must seal off. And also you need to get your elbows into other parts to lubricate or service or indeed install working parts. But I had the Duchess experience to call on. The KG5 has a radio receiver in the wheelhouse to prevent signal blocking by the aluminium hull, which makes for long cable runs, for example, from the rudder servo to the bridge is 12 feet and from the engine room it's six feet. The receiver battery is housed in the life jacket locker behind the wheelhouse and can be easily accessed from port or starboard when afloat when switching on or off. And she has a main isolator switch under a hinged thermofan box in front of the main mast. To explore the adherence of aluminium to epoxy, I began work on the bridge, which is here, by cutting teak panels and using one mil, mil aluminium for the deck. Strips had a small gap left between them for the deck. And I filled that with a mixture of epoxy and black dye and then power sanded. It stuck okay. So the wheelhouse was the first bit. I developed a routine of starting a session with the lighting of the stove in the concrete garage during a Scottish winter. Apart from keeping me from freezing up, this also served to dispose of off cuts and provided a heat source to dry the cut sections of metal after they'd been cleaned with a Brillo pad and rinsed them water immediately prior to application of epoxy. It worked, at least it has so far. I went through three tons of dried oak firewood and bought a roller bender online, built a stocks with six by two inch timbers, three planks screwed together with legs to the same height as my workbenches and saws, four meters long, and marked off the hull station from bow to stern. Now you'll all be familiar with this, the hull lines, and this is the KG-5. The center line is the center of the ship. The left-hand side is from the stern to midships, and the right-hand side is from the bow to midships. And these represent the shape of the hull at regular intervals. The keel are actually made as a sheet with two millimetre aluminium, cut to the turn of the bilge, and bent to a V-shape in the vise. KG5 was not flat bottom. There's the bender.
The first main bulkhead was marked off and cut from two millimetre sheet, with cuts made at lower deck, main deck and promenade deck to take the horizontal angle section, which you can see there, which was run lengthwise to reduce deck supports and scuppers, as well as the frame for the plating. With each bulkhead cut to suit a station, I worked from midships towards bow and stern, building first the battery box or boiler room, which extended to the promenade deck. This box gave a rigid fixture to tie down on the stocks. So here's the frame with the boiler room. Jeannie Dean's hiding in the background. Again, frames starting to come together. And the first of the plates. So the plating is one millimetre aluminium. Drilling through the plate and the frame countersinking and bolting with three mil brass bolts, washers and nuts, but also gluing with epoxy resin. Each plate would have 68 bolts, plating from stem to bow, keel to deck, took a while. I could see the whole thing coming together. I think there were over 100 plates of approximately six inches by four, but I certainly got through more than a thousand nuts and bolts as I had to order more to finish the job. Once up past the main deck, I had to mark and cut the windows. That's the hole for the shaft. Bow section filled with resin. Does anyone know how many windows the KG5 had? 85 each side, plus side lights and portholes. Here we're getting up to main deck. Belting going on. As the windows marked, drilled, and then filed. My wife was curious about how long this would take. And frankly, so was I. We calculated my average weekly hours to a total and multiplied by the minimum wage and got the answer of more than £90,000. I don't do commissions. Decks were cut from one millimetre sheet. Well, here's the two brass tubes shafts, props, and bearings. And that's then going into place. Dining room starting to appear. Shade deck starting to appear. Nice tidy workshop. Shed deck. These are the areas that are, are going to be lost. Once, once the decking goes on, you no longer got access to them. So they were filled with foam. Some paint starting to go on. The wee KG5 watching from the shelf. It's the house that's for sale, not the model. First test tank. Funnels going on. Funnels are made from four inch aluminium tube. 
squeezed in a vice to an oval shape prior to having oval spacers placed inside, subsequently bolted to the deck. The teak deck going down, the lead weights to hold hold it until the glue set. More decking. It's the coloured epoxy prior to sanding. First coat of paint on the funnels. Colour's always a controversial issue with model ships. So I went to home base in Oban to the Dulux mixer and asked the 17 year old assistant for McBrain's red, please. Which drew a few funny looks. Railings going on. Test tank. View of the inner batteries on the right hand side and the engine room on the left. Easiest way to transport. Some of the details, hinge doors, doll's house hinges. And finally, fifteenth of October, twenty eighteen. She goes. Went well, but she was just underpowered for this 240 mile an hour wind she was going to encounter. There's a few people wondering how many pints they had that day. Seeing the King George V sail by. This is the access, these are the decks that come off. The engine room. I had, to sw I had to change the couplings. It's that, the couplings are actually LPG rubber pipe, which flexes. And there's a small piece of wire through, should there be a fouling. In theory, the wire will snap off. The two blue boxes are the electronic speed controllers. and uh, a couple of upgraded motors. They're actually from a wheelchair. Dining room. The boiler room or battery space. The view from the rear deck forward, promenade deck. This is why I was looking for photographs of the inside, Eric Schofield. Thank you very much for sending me some. The receiver in the wheelhouse. And of course, Santa Claus, he, he's a bit of a tradition with King George V. The Model Steamer Club did a winter display in Bashaw Park, I think it was, a kind of frostbite series. 
My father put Santa Claus on the bridge, which was mentioned in dispatches. So it's a bit of a tradition. Here's the main switch. When you see smoke coming out it, that's where you head. This boiler casing on the promenade deck houses the smoke generators. And there's a little fan in the engine room, computer fan, which pushes air forward, which ventilates the speed controllers and also helps the smoke to exit up the funnels. These posters are real posters which have been reduced on the computer. Bit of a job to make that, but it works. Dining room chairs from China. Hell hath no fury like a dad whose tools are missing. This is the sort of thing you get bought for you. And these are the chairs, mass production. Point apparatus chairs. And there are two styles of single chairs on KG5, which I went to the etchers for. Any article now on model boat building will mention the phrase, I'm waiting on my etchings coming back, where the whole side of a ship can be drawn on a computer email to the etcher and then it comes back already formed with all the details and of course we've got 3D printers now which I, I, I have had nothing to do with so far but the etchers will do a very good plate and they, they go almost as small as you want the window frames now, what do you do with a model ship once you've built it? Well, you try and save the Waverley with it. So we took it to Oban, and uh, this is the departure lounge, Cal lounge Calmac, St Andrew's Day 2019. So it was a bit quiet in there, so we decided to go for a coffee. So here we are in the middle of Oban. Brendan O'Hara, SNP, MP, was canvassing. Said it was, the, it was the busiest 15 minutes of the day. The King's Tower and the Hutchison Monument in the background. This is Ian Quinn and myself. I think it was over at the North Pier where he managed to accost what turned out to be a French family who had no idea what we were talking about. But as soon as Ian mentioned Dunkirk, out came the wallet and the money went in the tin. Captain Alan Sinclair is recently retired from Calmac from the Isle of Mull and uh, he's joined the club. So this is him driving while I'm filming. He was very amused at the sound of an engine telegraph.
So this is Locha Varein again. Now, his captains think they're going to make it past the mark. I wonder. Seat of the pants, I think, Alan. It's quite a blustery day. This would have been August 2020. If you just bear with this clip a wee minute, the camera starts to focus on the grass. And it comes back. This is Alan doing a handbrake turn. One ahead, one astern. Back to full ahead.
this is some of the exhibitions we've been to. This is through it, the tall ships in Leith. Summer Lee. This is as small as I go. 10 BA. Can't handle anything smaller than that. Brook and Glen with a, a wee Blair Moore pier, I think. And some of the fixtures and fittings and moulds that um, I used to make vents, lifeboats at the top. My 1924 lathe. Some other projects. We KG5 with a tube ripped out. Lockdown. New motors going in there. This is a wee jig for making the railings. And model rail fittings, um, which sometimes you can get the right scale. This is for bending. And offcuts. How do you move these things about? Well, You tie the hydraulic lift to the model stand, keep them together, and then wiggle it across. Once on the hydraulic, you can raise and lower. So it goes down onto the launching trolley. And then the hydraulic trolley can be pulled out. And it's from there out into the vehicle. I've also got this trolley, which we used in open. I sometimes transport it on that trolley. Another launching trolley, an old faithful one. This is the, the room I keep them in. KG5 keeking out the window there and the master van in the background and the workshop off to the right. I've got this, I can either have it as a ramp or I can lift it up level with the van. So, vital piece of equipment. Another project. Now, I found this in amongst my father's stuff. So if I just read through, it's a passenger certificate for the King George V, for the small King George V, which, um, which he had laminated. And it says, for season 1st of May 1974 till 30th of September 1974, or until first fire, breakdown or collision, whereby this certificate is withdrawn. Vessel, King George V, Port of Registration, Maxwell Park, Glasgow. Gross tonnage, 9.85 pounds. Length, 5 foot 7.5 inches. Beam, 8 inches. Summer draft, 2 and a quarter inches. This passenger certificate is issued on behalf of McNutty's Steam Packet Company Limited, whereby the above mentioned vessel is licensed to carry passengers, 600 wee plastic people painted. Crew, 20 plus ships orchestra. Ponds, Danoon, Airdrie, Kilmarnock. Then passengers, 300 wee plastic people painted, provided Santa Clauses on the bridge, and an L flag is displayed on the mainmast. The crew, those members still brave enough, plus a three-piece band playing for those in peril on the sea. Ponds, Maxwell Park, Kilsyth, Largs and Barshaw. On ponds whose area exceeds the above, the number of wee plastic people pan painted must be reduced by 10 and a half. Ship surgeon available for such minor ops. For every further five square yards of pond, all wee plastic people on these occasions are conveyed at their own risk and should supply their own life jacket. Any of the aforesaid passengers who wish to volunteer for duty a ship's officer's crew, or anyone who can play a mouth organ, 
should on such occasions notify McNutty's Steam Packet Company Limited. This certificate does not allow the vessel to sail at Elder Park. A special certificate is required when sailing in consort, consort with turbine vessel Duchess of Montrose. This certificate is issued by the Keep Death Off The Sea campaign and the Pat and Pat Pushers Union, signed Parahandi. This vessel, King George V and their owner have now been certified. Here's some idea of his sense of humour. I think that about sums it up, and I think time-wise we're getting getting on a bit. Uh, I've, you can view some uh, short film clips, if you like, on YouTube. If you type in Jeannie Dean's 2020 or Lock of Arain. Well, I think that concludes my talk this evening. Thank you for listening. I'm pleased to answer any questions. <laughs>